Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Paraclete Press, welcome to our virtual launch of God, Grace, and Horses by Lori Brock. My name is Rachel McKendry. I'm the publicist here at Paraclete. Thank you so much for joining us today. A recording of today's launch will be available later on to share with anyone who couldn't join us. And we'll also let you know how you can get a copy of God, Grace, and Horses, along with Lori's first book, Horses Speak of God. Please take a second to find the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and feel free to submit any questions you may have for Lori through the launch and we'll hope to get to everyone. Lori Brock is an Episcopal priest and attorney with roots in Alabama and Mississippi. Upon moving to Kentucky over a decade ago, she realized she needed a hobby. A call to a riding lesson barn later, she found a passion and life in horses. Horses teach her about God and provide endless opportunities for laughter and learning. Lori also serves as a crisis chaplain, retreat leader, and speaker. And as mentioned previously, she's also the author of Horses Speak of God. Thank you so much for spending this time with us today, Lori. Congratulations on a beautiful second book. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And thank you for everybody joining me. I'm going to like silence my phone because my friends will text me and <laughs> and be like, oh, well, I'm glad you're working today. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to take a second to hold up these books, which are so beautiful together. Even the cover takes you instantly into this world that you've discovered and so generously share with us. I love the cover. The cover reminds me, um, I was at a ranch uh, this past summer, and I'm going to go again uh, in Colorado. And when we were looking at the pictures, I was like, ah, that's the picture. Cause it, we walked out one sunset uh, to the horse corral to see all the horses grazing. And of course we were very uninteresting to them, but it just, the sun was setting. And when I saw that picture, I was like, that's the cover. Stunning, stunning. So tell us about this new book, Lori. So I um, got an email actually from the then editor of Paraclete. He said like, do you have another horse book in you? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I was just, you know, working on the proposal and kind of got everything sent in. And, and I want to say not even two weeks later was when everything shut down with the pandemic. And, and I just thought, what, I think I signed the contract maybe the day that, you know, everything was started to close down and I thought, what am I doing? Um, so I would say this was one of the hardest books to write simply because it was in such an unusual um, mm -hmm. space. And the thing that I did when I would get stuck, which was go to the barn, I couldn't do uh, for six weeks. They just, mm -hmm. everything closed down. And yet it was probably, um, I think such a wonderful exercise in really digging into mm -hmm. what it meant to experience this life of faith, um, in the midst of something that we were all going through together globally. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and also just kind of being very quiet with, with writing and and digging into what does it really mean like why I was saying like why would anybody want to read this book um and and I hope if you like horses you do but one of the things that I really got to explore in here was you know solitude and yearning and and loneliness and 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 the value of the relationships that we have and what it meant to not be able to have those relationships in the ways that we that we existed and how much of that really found a home in the barn and found a home in the space I was with horses and just the way that words that we hear in our in our language when we talk about grace and love and faith and all of that mm -hmm. you know even friendship mm -hmm. um that just got really in some ways expanded so much uh when I had to sit down and think and you know I, I was there's, I think it's Mark Twain. I remember somebody has the quote that I don't enjoy writing. I enjoy having written. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that that's certainly true, but <laughs> it was such a gift to be able to, to use this book as a way that I could work through the pandemic and get through that time. Um, mm. And, and also just realize this was something I'd never gone through before. None of us had, I think, unless you were old enough to have lived through the Spanish flu. Yeah. Um, but also to realize you, the the wisdom that horses brought to that for me um, mm. in in ways that none of us are still able I think to to give a definition to what we went through or meaning to that mm -hmm. um, horses did in their wisdom so mm. I think if you're struggling to figure out and put meaning to stuff in the pandemic I you know I hope that this book offers a way to do that 
Absolutely. Um, I love the simplicity of this title, God, Grace, and Horses. And, you know, there's a lot of language and faith that I think we sort of toss around. And I think about grace and I think, okay, how do you define that word? You're, you're an Episcopal priest, you're a lawyer, you're a writer, you're a wordsmith, but, and I know there are some things that are more experienced than explained, mm. but how do you explain grace? Oh, you know, to me it is, and I, it, it's sort of a thread that runs through the whole book and how I explain it, but you know, you know, we have an, an official Episcopal definition. I think if you look in lots of definitions, you know, and it's the thing that is un, unearned and undeserved. And I remember watching Nina, who's my horse, and she is, she's now, I said, she's now officially a, a, a mature lady. And so she mostly, she's retired from showing and she teaches little bitties um, how to walk and trot and canter because she's mm -hmm. so patient with them. But I watched her one day, um, I had finished riding I'd gone out to the arena and there was probably a little six-year-old girl who was just kind of learning how to canter. And, and in horses, you cue different gates by, by the way that you move your rein and by the way that you do your leg. And, and in saddlebreds, you actually just say the word. They actually know English very well, or Spanish <laughs> or whatever language you use. And I, and I was watching this little girl, and, you know, to think like, it's a lot to do for any of us. I mean, I think sometimes when I get really panicky on the horse, my instructor, Stephanie, will be like, stop overthinking it and just trust that you know how to do it. But I watched this little girl try just trying so hard to figure out like which rein to pull in and how, and, and how to do this. And I just remember at one point, and it was such a wonderful moment of seeing Nina just decide it was good enough. You know, and I don't think she ever got all the cues, but Nina was like, that's good enough. And I'm going to step off at canter and just yeah. beautifully. And just the, the space that that little girl took off back on the saddle, like realizing she had done this. And I thought, well, she didn't quite do it, but she did. And I remember that moment, I thought that Nina's showing me what grace is, cool. you know, and I just, and to me, one of the lines I wrote in the book was the grace of good enough. And mm -hmm. Nina I think reminds us that grace is not perfection. It's not, it's not an achievement. It's that moment when we just kind of do the best we can in a situation and God <sighs> smooths out the edges for us. And, and I just, you know, and I, and I think I don't deserve, I don't deserve Nina. None of us do. None of us deserve <laughs> the love of the horses, but I just watched her decide that's good enough. I'll, and then the rider's response to realize I, she did it. She was like, yeah. I did this. I had made this big horse canter. And, and it was really <laughs> that moment of realizing grace is the thing that just helps us remember that we, we can do it and mm -hmm. we can do it better. Mm -hmm. when we keep trying. I love that. Thank you. I know you wanted to read some. I do because that's what, we, that's what we do. So, but it's a short part. So if you're sitting there going, She's gonna read a whole chapter. No, I'm not. But this is from the this is from the introduction. My relationship with horses began when I was three. My father's family had horses, and one of my first times sitting on a horse was captured in a photograph. When I see it, I see two creatures of God who are wondering, "What if? What if I rode you to somewhere else? What if I listened to your wisdom to who you are? What if my breath became so intertwined with yours that I learned to breathe better?" to live better, to pray better? What if I let you move me in a different way to an understanding of God and grace that was beyond anything I could discover on my own? I'm still trying to do these things. However, I'm fairly sure that my three-year-old self didn't think any of that, not then. I just loved holding on to a thick wavy mane of the mare on which I sat. Mm. Humans have ridden horses for eons, and we've been in a relationship with them for far longer. This book is about my experience in the saddle. No other human can discover the world for anybody else, but we can resonate with each other's experiences. We can and do need companions along the way as we learn to move differently. I saddled up and let horses move me from what was familiar into what I needed to discover about God, about grace and about me. And by the way, if you haven't seen it on the back cover, that's 
this is Nina. And yes, she is a big puppy dog. So <laughs> she's very- a beauty. I love it. So Lori, I know you you talk about that picture about the first time you were on a horse. And in the little bio we read, said that when you got to Kentucky, you made that first call to a riding lesson barn. <laughs> is that a story you like to tell? It is because, you know, I've read, and I'm sure we all have the experiences of people who kind of make this magnificent entrance into something that's amazing. And there's always like a, you know, like planets aligned to do it. Um, I, I literally just realized, cause I had been um, serving at the church where I'm still at for about a year. And I realized like, Oh, I, you know what? I'm going to become one of those clergy people that all they ever do is church. Like all it's all they ever do. And I didn't want to do that. Um, and so I, I looked up on um, a Groupon. Actually, I was saying back when Groupon was still like kind of really cool and you could get rest. I, and I, and, it, and it, it popped up and I had no idea what I was signing up for. And I just said, okay, I'll, I'll do some writing lessons. And, and so, you know, it was really, I think just kind of as I like to describe it, pathetically ordinary. And yet in that space, you know, I think that's where, that is where we encounter God. You know, I think it's not always in the great mountaintop experiences of, you know, it isn't just that recognizing that there's a need we have and then, and paying attention to that need. Um, and I don't know that even in the first few months that I rode, I, I thought like, Oh, this is life changing. Uh, but it, it was engaging. And there was something that I felt kind of moving in my soul that I was like, I, I kind of really, you know, like doing this and, mm. uh, and just kept going back and going back. And for me, the real moment when I said, this is something I need to do was when the barn that I originally started writing with closed down their writing program. And I went to another barn and I actually do tell that story in God, Grace and Horses, because for a fleeting moment, I thought, well, maybe I just have ridden like maybe this is just it and it's come to a natural end and I remember thinking no like no I can't do that I have to keep riding and that was when I realized like oh we're shifting into something a little different here and so um I think I've been at actually wingswept for our ride I was talking with Anita and Stuart who were two of the Wednesday night riders with me and they started out at the original barn I think we'd all realized we'd been there maybe for 10 years now oh so, my gosh I know and it doesn't even seem that long but it's like oh yeah we you know, we've been there long enough to know where some of the bodies are buried and have buried a few ourselves. So, <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Lori, um, I love the titles of every single chapter in this book. And I love um, the way that you've divided it sort of into different places on the trail, in the arena, in the barn, and then in the presence of God. I think one of the great gifts that you have to offer to your readers is knowing that um, it's not just about being in church. It's about being where you are. Like you're just talking about that ordinary moment that you had or during the pandemic where we were all trapped. Um, Can you talk a little bit about that? I think the church has done such a really, really poor job of acting like the only way you can experience God is within the four walls of, of a building that is consecrated, like a church or a holy space. Um, and in fact, that's not at all true. Even in the Bible, that's not true. I mean, mm. you know, Jesus doesn't do ministry only in the synagogue. I mean, he is there and he clearly goes there to pray, but he is out and about in people's houses and in back alleys and hanging out on beaches. And I mean, so he's, all over the place. And I think that in our desire to hold up the importance of what it means to gather with community in holy space and pray, we have done a really poor job of recognizing that every place we go is holy. Hmm. Um, and it really is a matter of, of, kind of just being in that space and saying, oh, like, you know, this hiking trail is holy. I mean, you know, Nina Stahl is holy and, Mm -hmm. you know, all of those spaces, can we be present to holiness and to God wherever we are? And I think, again, I think that's one of the things that faith communities are struggling with now post pan or not even post pandemic, but still kind of in this space with all the hybrid ministry and digital ministry, like, well, can you really be a member of a church if you're not attending? 
Um, and I think that again, it's, you know, underneath it all to me has always been about power. Like, well, you have to come to church. But I also think recognizing that there are people who just don't want to ever walk in a church building because maybe they don't live close to one, but also maybe they've been deeply damaged and wounded by institutional religion. And that's not a safe place for them anymore. And, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, God is always calling us to feel safe and feel loved. And, and if, that's in, if, if that's in an arena, it mm -hmm. is. If it's, if it's in a holy space in, in your home, it is. If it's, if it's sitting out in your backyard, you know, with a glass of iced tea in the summer and watching birds, it is. Wherever we are is holy. And I think that the, the more that we, we as people of faith can share that truth and share that good news with people to say, be holy where you are, it suddenly shifts our whole perspective of the world. I mean, I suddenly become very aware of why it's important to take care of our creation because all yeah. creation is holy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and holiness in the ordinariness. In I think. the ordinary. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I mean, there's, I went, I went riding yesterday and uh, Indy, who is one of my new favorite horses and she's a little baby. And so she's still learning, but she is all about wanting to snuggle. Like she just wants mm -hmm. to do you know, like get right. And I, and I thought, you know, I, it was that moment of, I don't have anything to do right now. Stop and be present with her, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. cause not all horses are like that. Some horses are like, <laughs> we're done, get away from me. But you know, she's not. And I think that's part of it is, oh, wait, I need to stop and just mm -hmm. take in this moment. Um, mm -hmm. And, and it doesn't mean everything is life. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm in Kentucky, close to where Thomas Merton is and had the whole revelation in Louisville of everything. And I think he was on a street. Yeah. I mean, I've been on that corner. It's a street corner. It's not particularly beautiful. There's no mountains. There's, you know, yeah. her unicorns were not prancing down the, it was a regular <laughs> busy street. Yeah. And yet Thomas Merton had this revelation that really in some way changed his whole um, aspect. And if Brian Cole is watching this, he's very excited that I just mentioned Thomas Merton. He talked Brian <laughs> as a friend of mine, but um. And I think that's the question is God asked us, can you see the holy in the ordinary? And I think mm -hmm. one of the great gifts horses gave me and continue to give me is they, they not only ask me that question, but then they just keep challenging me. You know, can you see the yeah. holy in the ordinariness of having a bad ride? Can you see the holy in the ordinariness of just, you know, watching an, a new uh, foal take its first steps? Uh, mm -hmm. can, can you see that? Um, and that is hard. I mean, that's kind of right up there with having to love your enemy. It's hard yeah. to do. I don't always want to see the holiness when I'm dragging the trash out and it's right. <laughs> 12 degrees and icy. So, or, yeah. or having to go, you know, pick water, you know, ice off the top of water. And yet that moment is holy too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love, um, in all the stories that you tell, there's a certain degree of like being brought to your knees at <laughs> different times, humility in so many different ways, which I think every single one of us has experienced during the pandemic, those moments where you can't get toilet paper at the grocery store, or you're not sure if it's safe to go to CVS, even though you need, you know, whatever you need. Um, and, and just for those of you who aren't familiar with Lori's work in every chapter, um, there are these such personal, vulnerable moments where, I mean, you th that's where you are. And I think that's where y you meet horses, where you meet God, and then where you help us meet them too. So I just didn't know, um, I mean, some of them are funny and some of them will make you cry, but <laughs> if there's a particular moment where that um, humility, <laughs> you know, where those moments of just being brought straight to your knees, if there are any of those you wanted to share. <laughs> My daily life is filled with humility. I think that humility, <laughs> I will say this, I think for any leader and for any any clergy person, for any community, humility is is the thing that will keep you like where you are. Cause we can get, you know, I don't, you know, to me, like one of the one of the spaces of humility that I, I remember, and I, and I will tell you, it was the first. I had really struggled about how to write this. What was it going to look like? I didn't want it to be kind of just, you know, I had the whole thing like, I don't know that I just want to be the writer who writes about horses all the time, which one of my friends was like, really? Like, that's a bad thing. And you know, <laughs> so, um, but the first essay that I wrote or the draft of it was the one about Izzy. Um, and, and I remember that, that humility of, 
of of what it feels like to to, to and Izzy Izzy did not die. I'm just gonna but but she did her 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 owner did move and and when she moved she took Izzy with her and I just remember kind of sitting and feeling all of that loss because I couldn't really get there with the numbers of people who were dying with COVID and all that. But but I remember walking in, remembering walking into her stall and realizing it was empty and she wasn't there. And mm. and I think that, you know, loss and grief, it, it levels the playing field on all of us. And, mm-hmm. and it's why we don't like it. It's why most of us will do anything we can, you know, to avoid actually feeling grief. Yeah. But I just, you know, you know, Izzy is that horse that boy, she humbled me. She could humble me faster. And again, she's, she, she gets a lot of airtime in the first book, but yes, because um, I ride Izzy. I remember. Right. I mean, she, she hated certain riders and she loved certain riders. And I will say that Izzy and I, and I think I have the language in there about like, we finally had our kind of Hallmark, you know, Christmas movie moment where she and I decided we'd really did like each other. And we, and, but, you know, I, the value of having such an, a presence and such an incarnation of a creature of God that so brutally brought humility into my life. Yeah. And, and, and in that brought so much love. I mean, she's a horse that I, I, I miss her almost every day that mm-hmm. I go out there because I remember I could have a terrible day in the world of ministry or whatever, or I could do this, you know, thing in chaplaincy and all this and I could go out and ride her and in that moment realize and to me I think that's an aspect of humility is realizing this is all that matters you know it was me riding her and and I just the humility of of what it meant to admit how much I miss her and missed her you know and 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 then also to recognize what a gift it was just to have her for the time that we all got to ride her at the bar you know Mm -hmm. that you know, who would I be as a writer? And I think I say that, you know, Izzy saved me from being a, a, a tentative writer because you could not be tentative on her. She would take it out on you if you were. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, she's still alive. She's enjoying her life, but I was told to lead with that. Um, after Nina, that's the horse people ask about if they've read the book, how's Izzy? And then I'm so, so now, but you know, I think humility is one of those great aspects of being human that if we explored more, the world would be in a much better place. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I mean, even, um, the, the, the pandemic challenge, like what you talked about not being able to go to church, if that's where your family is, were you, were you able to go to the barn during the pandemic or did you have to stay away? We had, we had, um, I think it was six weeks. It may have been a little longer than that where we, we could not, we couldn't go to the barn at all. Like that was, and then when stuff started opening back up, like you have to wear a mask, we could go to the barn because we were outside. So, and, and the weather by then it was, I want to say we could go like late April. So the weather had was warm enough that we could all be outside. And we only, and, you know, I will say that Stephanie and Chris did an amazing job of kind of maneuvering and navigating to Mm. say, you know, like, okay, we're only going to have X number of riders out here at a time and you can't, you can't come hang out. So you come and you can ride. And if you own a horse, you can check on your horse, but nobody else can be in the the barn with you when you're doing. So they did a really good job of of keeping everybody, you know, as safe as we could be. And, and I will say we did not have any COVID outbreak at the barn. So we were great, very thankful for that. Um, But, you know, that was like the longest, that's the longest I hadn't ridden since I started writing and it was, it was just really, really strange. And I remember getting back on the horse and it was our, our our usual Wednesday night group. Most of us came and we sort of were staggered because I think only four of us could ride at a time, but I knew we were staggered because we, and we, we kind of timed it so we could all see each other in the parking lot and, you know, but I remember popping back on the horse and, and just thinking, and if Spencer was the one I rode and I, I remember Sandy said, she said, oh my God, it is so clear that you are so thankful to be back on the horse. And it was hilarious because all the horses were like, you know, they weren't, I mean, they just hadn't been ridden. So they were, they had been ridden a little, but they had not been in their lessons. And so we joked that a few of them looked like they were ready to fold at any moment because they had gained some weight and <laughs> of course. We'd all gained some weight. Like we all did. Yeah. We all did. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, you know, I remember, and, and again, I, that, you know, 
I, I wrote about that experience because I think, again, you know, yearning is one of those concepts and words in faith that we don't talk about because the idea of yearning for something and not being able to have it is just yeah. such an uncomfortable place to be. Yeah. Um, and, and for that time period to realize like I couldn't ride, the place that I went to to kind of ground myself was not there. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, like everybody else, I walked my dog like 7,000 times a day kind of thing. But that space was really helpful to me in my, in my life of faith because I think I realized like, oh, not having something does made me realize how much I really did need it and want it. And, um, and that this, this wasn't just a passing fad or, you know, something, um, but just also not only the horses, the community of the barn. I mean, yeah. how, how, um, so it was, it was wonderful to finally, you know, be back out there. And so we had temperature checks and mask and stuff for, and then once the vaccine was out and everybody was fully vaccinated. So um, we're all, we're all happily doing our thing now, but uh, it was, it was a long, I think I said it was six, six or seven weeks of not riding because er just everything shut down. Yeah. I love um, the way in, in both books really, but um, thinking particularly of the chapter later on where you're talking about picking Nina's hooves. Oh, yeah. and, um, something about the, intimacy and immediacy of the whole community of the barn between the people and the horses also between the people and each other mm. and i think um a horse needs to be taken care of we need to be taken care of not all of us like that <laughs> and like you say some horses like to be groomed and some really do not and the number of lessons in just community and how to love and how to be loved that you find in the barn. Um, I don't know. I just know personally how much those moments in the book have meant to me. It's, you know, grooming is one of the space. I mean, horses, I had the really great uh, pleasure of, of getting to talk to one of the um, equine scientists at the University of Kentucky, which has an amazing equine program. And we talked at length about, you know, that horses are, are prey animals. They, they are on, lower on the food chain and, and their, their size and their speed actually are kind of, and, her, and their herd bound keeps them safe. But that the one place that they can't, you know, keep people away from them is when they need to be groomed. Mm. And so that's, you know, they actually have to let their guard down and certainly now to be ridden and that, but um, you know, Nina thinks being groomed is like the best thing on earth. I mean, she just <laughs> loves it and, you know, knows exactly, you know, and, and if I don't like do it in the order she wants it, she's like, no, no, you're supposed to rub my face now, you know, um, <laughs> but it is. And I think also for me, like you talked about the care of, of what I call you know, our barn family at Wingswept and also that, you know, how to groom the horse you're grooming. You know, the steadfastness of being out there for as long as many of us have been out there. I mean, Anita, who rides out there, we joke that we're going to have shirts that we can wear when we're, we're, you know, older that says, if found, return to wing swept, because like that's <laughs> where we're, but um, I think the idea that you, you know, the horse and you know, like which ones will love to be groomed and which ones will pick and which ones need a little help, which ones don't like to have, you know, some of the horses don't like to have their noses bothered with, and some horses are funny about their back end. So you have to be careful about it. And, you know, I think that we miss in our human relationships that we are in so many ways, so similar, you know, the way that will help one person, you know, the way we might like to be helped in time of trouble and a time of being upset may not be the way that somebody else does. And can we, again, have the humility to ask the question about, how can I help you, yeah. you know, and, and be, and, and be willing to hear no. I, you know, I think that's, you know, I, I will say one of the great gifts of the, of, of our barn family is when any of us are sort of going through a time, I've noticed how well we do the whole, like, you know, we sort of know like which ones of us need the space and which one of us needs to say, Hey, I'm going to go take a walk out to see the new babies. Do you want to walk with me? You know, and finding that, and I think that's something that comes out of a relationship and it comes out of making mistakes. I mean, yeah. you learn which horses 
you know, are funny about their back end by moving fast out of a kick sometimes. So, yeah. you know, and I, again, I think we live in this world where we're, we're, we kind of want to, to be successful at everything. And, and, um, and I think sometimes to get to that level means that we have to make some mistakes. But I think that, you know, the generosity of asking people, how can I help you? Um, and not to, uh, as a priest, I will say one of the clergy are the worst. We love to inflict pastoral care on people. Um, often when it's not wanted and, <laughs> you know, just the value of asking the question and of paying attention and of recognizing the, well, just because one person likes that. I mean, I, I would never look at one horse and say, well, I can't believe that horse doesn't, you know, let you jerk its mouth around because, you know, the other horse does. I mean, I yeah. clearly know that they're different. And I think we have to give that same gift to the humans that we're in relationship with. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, talking about humans and families and communities, I um, know that you've written this fantastic discussion guide, which is being designed and will go online and become available. But um, do you have like a specific recommendation of how church groups or book groups or, you know, friends who read together, how to, how to approach your book? Well, it was interesting to approach the discussion guide because the first one I did, I, I did um, like two or three questions for each chapter and I started out and I realized that this book was longer and I was like, oh, we're going to have 900 questions by the end of this. <laughs> um, one of the, one of the things that I did and, and it, it, it isn't, you don't have to read this book from cover to cover. It, it works if you want to pull out some essays to read, you know, there's, there's some information, but I try to, uh, I try to make sure that if you're just randomly picking it up and reading one that you can, you can read it and you'll sort of know where we are. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think it's, I realized kind of after I did it, that it sort of set up well for if you wanted to use it for a, for a seasonal series like Lent, or if you want to do a month, but I think the easiest way to do it is to maybe, you know, read uh, two or three essays and then discuss those. And I know some, I, I zoomed in because that's one of the great things about uh, that we have learned is I zoomed in with a book club that was reading uh, Horses Speak of God. And what they had done is they had assigned the essays to different people to lead the discussion. Nice. And I thought that was just brilliant. Is it yeah. different people in their group said, well, and I think everybody read everything, but you didn't have to either, but um, they, they assigned it. And then that person talked about like what they found at the essays and, you know, what was challenging. And, and so it was really, you know, I think that it, you know, it works well for a devotional book, but it mm -hmm. also just works well, you know, if you, so you're going to read one every day or every week, yeah. but I think it also works well to uh, invite you to explore. And I would say this, if you have never ridden a horse and you've never been on a horse, that's okay. Like Absolutely. I actually, I will say that I'm the only person in my uh, immediate family that rides horses. Uh, and so I would run this by some of my friends and family and say, do you understand what I'm saying here? Because, and if, and if they said, oh yeah, I understand it. So if you've never been on a horse, you just like them or you just want to read, that's, that's great. I, you don't have to, this does not presume prior knowledge. <laughs> Absolutely. That is the truth. I'm just going to remind everybody who's listening in. I don't mean to hog the conversation. If anybody has any questions for Lori or comments yeah. or wants to pipe in, please feel free. Lori, how did it work writing in the middle of the pandemic? Did you have to, well, I guess we were sort of holed up by nature. <laughs> I think that it was, I would say it was the hardest thing I've ever done yeah. till now. I always feel like when I say that, God's like, really? So, <laughs> just the way. But it was also a really, I mean, it gave me some structure when I, because I was, you know, running the church and we were online and do, and having to sort of rethink how to do pastoral care. We didn't and I think for first, it gave me a real space for, um, to say, this is a, this is a place for create, for creativity. In some ways it's about me. I mean, and I, that sort of sounds more selfish than I'd like it to, but because I was doing so much trying to keep everything else going yeah. um, that, you know, this was a space that I could say, oh, well, I'm, I'm doing this. And I will say one of the other brilliant things that came out of this was that 
you know, I would, so my pattern is that I write in the morning and then I take Evie out for, we go for about 30, 45 minute walk. And cause she has to inspect the, the neighborhood because mm. we don't ever know what's going on at night and she needs to keep people <laughs> in line. And, and what would sort of happen in, you know, the, the poet Rilke says, you know, I know the way by walking. And I think like you write by walking and I, Silas House has mentioned this in some of his writings. And so as I would walk, I would kind of go like, oh, oh, that's, that's the way, that's kind of where I want that essay to go. And then I would come back and if there were, and I make some notes sometimes, but I was, I think he gave me some structure that I didn't have because mm. nothing was structured, you know, in that time, you know, and I also think it gave me a way to begin to process what we were experiencing. I, I tried, I, I mean, I think I tried not to make it like a book about the pandemic there there are I think two or three yes. essays in there that are very pandemic um and so that was that was part of that challenge because I wasn't having to write COVID policies and you know so so I was um but it was it was a really I think a gift to be able to get back to writing in a way that wasn't associated with like COVID yeah and but there is I would say, you know, when I talk about write, writing to people, I, I will say there's nothing easy about it, whether it's a sermon, whether it's a <laughs> newsletter. I mean, it's just, you know, and the heart and, and the heart and um, nothing, I have a, I have a magnet that I got from the New York Public Library that says um, good reading is damn hard writing. And it is, uh, you <laughs> know, if a book reads well, then you can bet some people at a lot to get that. <laughs> exactly. Elise is asking, good question, Elise. Will uh, you be able to have an audiobook version of this new wonderful book? I love it. So, so full and fair disclosure, uh, you, if you read in the back about the dedication, Elise is, is one of the people that I dedicated to. She and I have been oh, friends nice. for a long time. And Lovely. she's uh, there will be. And in fact, the great thing about Paraclete is that they have figured out how to do the audiobook without me having to come up there, which I was really disappointed by. <laughs> ever get to go to um uh, get to go to orleans and see it it's beautiful but uh i but they shipped all the, this i have all this equipment now and i'm just waiting i've um i actually got the omicron very covid thankfully you know i was vaccinated so which is a bad call but i'm sort of waiting for some of this some of the ick to clear out but i i will be doing the audiobook from my very own home which should be interesting with a dog and three foster kittens at the moment. So <laughs> thankfully they're pretty quiet. Most they're oh, yeah. things <laughs> oh, because there's a sunbeam through the window and they are like the death ray, the kitten death ray has gotten them. So and maybe it's utilized. So that's awesome. Um, one of the metaphors that you use for faith journey is being on the trail. Hmm. And I love that one. Um because sometimes it's easy to stay on the trail and sometimes it's tempting to wander or sometimes you lose your way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I don't know, I wonder if you wanted to talk about that a tiny bit. You know, trail riding was, a, it, and it sounds like it shouldn't be, but it really was sort of a step into a, a new place of growth as a rider because I, you know, had ridden in arenas and my instructor was there. And then to, to go out on a trail, you've got sort of different factors. I mean, horses are, are they're wary about stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so go, I mean, going out on the trail is, a, it, you know, to me, it's, it's a little more uh, dangerous than, than being in the arena, being where it's a contained. And, um, and I think that's, you know, for me, that mirrors a lot of faith. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, again, I speak from a Christian point of view, but I think this goes, this is true for lots of faith traditions. It is very, it is easier to be Christian in the pews of your church than it is out in the world, because then you're going to run into people who like, don't use their turn signals. And, you know, I mean, like do all kind of annoying things that bother you. And then you're like, oh, I don't got to love these people too. So, so going out there and, and again, that was some of, of that imagery but the other thing that I found is that once I began to trust my ability to ride um and trust the horse because that's all you know like you have to sort of figure out 
Um, you know, Nina, I don't, I don't ride her in lessons anymore, but I take her out on the trail quite a bit. And she thinks trail riding is the most fun of any, you know, um, but it's, you know, an implicit trust that we have with her. And, and I, I just remember realizing, and, you know, and again, that, that you know, trying to be super Christian, because I like to do that on occasion of meditating and realizing that the meditation I needed was to be out on a trail and in a different place and see the world around. But the other thing about trails is, you know, if you're, if you're riding a horse and the horse almost always knows the trail better than you. If it's one that's, you know, if it's a trail that they've ridden a lot, trail horses know the trail better than you. And we, you know, again, that humility thing about having to be like, wow, this, this horse is smarter than me out here. Uh, and I was on a trail ride with, in one of the national parks and there was a woman who was on there and she was asking lots of questions and I was having a very hard time loving my neighbor at that point but one of the things she said is like you know what happens if if you know we get lost or something and I and the wrangler said ma'am if you just drop your reins that horse is going to go right back to the stable and and that again now that part hasn't been that's another section I actually did have to edit out some of the book but there's but just the idea of dropping the reins like that's your kind of control but that that horse would get you back to the stable and think about like how many times do we want to control our journeys yeah when we really need to drop the reins and let god take us to where we need to go you know and um but i you know i i love to go trail riding now and you know I, that's one of the things i get to do when i go out to uh, zapata ranch in colorado and i've been trail riding and sometimes you're on trails that you're not really you're like I, there were a few trails i've been out in wyoming i was like i don't really think this is a trail i don't know where we are but this isn't a trail but oh, look oh. we're on top of the mountain so um, <laughs> it i just you know it's a great metaphor and it's a, you know people who hike say the same thing I mean, you know, stay on the trail, but sometimes yeah. step off a little bit. Yeah. So. Yep. That's true. Oops. Did I do something funny? No, I just we're still here. Oh, okay. Catherine must have gone. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Well, thank you, Lori. I, um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to pipe in. But in the meantime, I'm going to tell you how you can get a copy of this book and of Horses Speak of God. I just have to keep holding them up because I think these covers are so beautiful. Even if I had never heard of Lori, if I saw this book, I have I'm nothing to do with it. it. <laughs> a million people at Pericle, they send it to me and I go, wow. So yeah, they're so beautiful. Um, to celebrate the launch today, if if you want to buy these books from Paraclete Press, you can use the coupon code HORSES22 and you'll get 20% off. And of course, they're available on Amazon and wherever else your local bookseller is always the place we recommend you go to first. And if they don't love, carry the yes. book, let us know and we'll find a way to get it to them. <laughs> we love and, to support local booksellers. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, and to go back to um, Elise's question, Right now, our audiobooks are available through Audible on Amazon. Um, so Horses Speak of God is there, and God, Graces, and Horses will be as soon as we'll we can be there. get it done wow. and get it up. Um, Lori is willing and available to join your small group via Zoom if you would like to have her to come and talk about the book and discuss it with you. So um, you can get in touch with me at Paraclete and I'll put my email address here if you wanna talk with Lori and we can work that out. Um, we also do have multiple copy discounts available for the book. So if you're interested in it for your church group, your Bible study, your book club, whoever it is, please get in touch because um, we wanna help get this into your hands. It's such a beautiful book. Like Lori said, you don't have to read it all at once. You can skip around. I'm thinking about Lent coming up. And if you're looking for a different kind of devotional book, this could very well be the perfect one for you. So I really recommend um, hop onto our website, paracletepress.com, take a look. There's sample chapters, hop onto Amazon and look inside. Um, just like We've had such a wonderful conversation with you here today, Lori. Reading is just like talking to Lori. So um, I can't recommend it enough. <laughs> I did. One of the things I, I would say that I, that I think is horses give me a way to understand God. You know, 
and I, the imagery to me that stays with me is you can't stare directly into the sun because a bad things will happen to your eyes. And, and but the moon reflects the sun's light. I mean that, and and you know the moon is just this beautiful thing that kind of lightens our 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 evenings. And you know if you've walked outside on a full moon night, you think, wow. Um, I think to me horses are the way that I can you know that God's light is reflected in my life. Mm. Um, and because I can't stare directly into God, I, 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 you know, I, the light of the light that God emanates and even the darkness that God emanates is all, um, is, is reflected back and horses is, is a way that I experience that. And it is different for different people. I mean, some people experience that in, in all manner of ways, yeah. arts, you know, music, and I think that if you've never, if you've never been on a horse, if you've just seen them from afar and, and, but to be able to understand that we can understand God through the very ordinary things in our lives. Yeah. And we should not be um, afraid to make those connections. And again, you know, we, we all know how to speak of God. It's just that we've been told we don't. And, and again, the wisdom of horses is, has said to me, yeah, you do. We're right here. So I, I would invite you, you know, if you feel a little disconnected, if you feel like, oh, you know, that's, I can't read that theology book. It's too much. Theology is, us, you know, the word of God is all around you. And it is a, a way that however you connect in your passion. And that is to me, the whole point of, of why I love writing these books. Well, hey, I get to be around horses and then go, hey, this might make a good essay, <laughs> you know, but also to encourage people, whatever brings you joy, whatever, you know, opens your heart and soul to, to being more, you know, yeah. more than what you thought you could do. God is in that space. Um, yeah. And if you can draw parallels from whatever you love to horses, that's great. For sure. Well, thank you so much, Lori. Thank you. I've loved being here. And um, I, I certainly hope to talk to more of you now that, you know, hopefully, hopefully, you know, numbers are starting to decline and that. So um, I will be out, hopefully be out and about in some places over the spring and summer. And again, I, you know, I'm happy to do Zoom. I'm happy to do in person as well as, you know, as I'm able. So I always remember I do have a full-time job, so there's the, but, <laughs> um, but I'm glad, I'd love to hear people tell me stories about their horses, and, you know, we need to, to, we joke about when two horse people find themselves at a party, everybody gets, we get our phones out, and we start showing and talking, so I, you know, to me, like, the fact that these books have enabled me to be in rooms of people who love horses, and all have wonderful stories about the very ordinary miracles that horses bring into our lives, it's just, yeah. A, such a gift. Such a huge gift. Amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you to all of you for joining us. And um, again, this will be available on YouTube later today. So if you have friends who couldn't come, you want to share it with folks in your church, in your small group, book group, whatever it is, please feel free. And um, your barn, if you're yeah, your barn, absolutely. Your barn. <laughs> yeah. So thank you again, Lori. Thanks to all of you. And I hope you have a great afternoon. And we'll see you soon. Thank you. Take care. You Bye. Bye-bye.